Hi everybody, welcome to uh, uh, Nakuho First Friday webinar. It's actually the second Friday of July. Hope you in July enjoyed your holiday. I'm here with um, Jen Anthony, Area Coordinator at Portland State University, and Courtney Sandler, Associate Director of Resident Life at Portland State University. Um, we're going to start with some brief introductions and then we'll just jump right in. Our presentations on new member recruitment, it isn't just for Greek life. So if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to just um, send them into the group chat and we'll answer them throughout. We're trying to make this um, as interactive as possible and we welcome your questions as they come up. So here's Jen and Courtney. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, so we've got a good amount to cover. Um, we first want to talk a little bit about where this presentation came from and, uh, and the, the Greek life connection if you're not familiar. Yeah, so hi, hi everyone, this is Courtney Sandler. Um, so for those that may be connected with Greek life, um, there are a few phases of our recruitment process. So there's the potential new member phase, the, or excuse me, the potential member phase, the provisional new member phase, and then the new member phase. And so how we kind of coordinate, correlate that to the experience within housing and residence life is the potential new member phase is like the recruitment phase for potential new members into our departments, into our institution, into the university, just like with Greek life. It's with learning and getting to know those folks into the organization and membership. The provisional member phase is for um, departments and institutions, the on-campus interview. Um, and so that's how that connects, where the provisional member phase is the phase in Greek life where new mem uh, provisional members are learning about the, the organization and going through a process to really understand what the organization is all about. And then the new member phase is when, um, for institutions and departments, the onboarding phase once the um, new employee gets to the institution. Likewise, with Greek um, organizations, the new member phase is when the um, new member has gone through the provisional member phase and is now a member of the organization and learning what they can to be a member of um, the society. So we thought it was important to share some of that perspective because we think Greek Life does a really great job of welcoming um, and really making their members part of the team. And so we want to give you that connection there. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're doing today uh, in our lovely hour with you, um, some of the quick outcomes. We're going to talk about our hiring process uh, from 2014 uh, as we recruited to the actual welcome. Uh, we brought on two folks that went through uh, TPE, the placement exchange, and then two more folks that came in later in the year. And so we had a, a big year last year for hiring. Um, so uh, really had a lot of opportunities to uh, work through our process. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk um, about my perspective as a candidate. So I went through TPE, the placement exchange, um, back in 2013 and was hired uh, at Portland State University. Uh, and then I also went through a couple of years before that and got my previous position. Um, but we thought that this dual perspective was really important to give you the experience of the candidate um, and then the experience of the university. And I went, um, this is Jen, I went with Portland State with Courtney and we worked together for the hiring. But Courtney's really going to dive in about Portland State specific stuff and, and what we did um, at PSU. So. Um, yeah, so we are going to jump right in. It appears the chat thing has gone away. So as, as Joanne said, feel free um, to holler any questions. We'll take a couple like quick sort of breaks in between each sort of stage of our process. Uh, so if you have things that specifically apply to, you know, finding the new potential member, um, welcoming, all that sort of stuff, we'll give you a chance to ask those questions. So. So now here's an at a glance of Portland State University housing and residence life. We currently have 18 professional staff members. We have 54 resident assistants, learning community assistants, and a new position we've created, the resident academic mentors. And we have approximately 2,200 students that live on campus with us. Um, we are comprised of 10 buildings that spread up across 12 blocks of the city. Um, and so we're kind of spread out. We have an east campus, west campus. And our average age of student is between 16 and 67. Um, Portland State University in general has a student population of approximately 30,000. So that kind of gives you an added glance of 
um, where we kind of stand with our traditional student population versus what our overall population may look like at Portland State. Um, that's it. Great. So we're going to jump in to finding the new potential member. You'll see, uh, so on your screen on the left-hand side, this is Courtney. Uh, if her little thing could wave hello. Okay, yep, <laughs> it would. Uh, and then that's me. You'll, you'll see where these come into play uh, in a few minutes. They are just our little arbitrary uh, cartoon things. But, well, I mean, they sort of are. Yeah, great. So um, the first aspect we're going to talk about within our process is finding potential new members. And that actually begins before the placement exchange. Um, and so what we do here on campus is we actually ask our current staff to um, submit letters of intent uh, to make sure that we're able to gain a perspective of what that looks like for our hiring process for that year and into the next. Um, we also gather job information um, related to those positions and update our job descriptions and move forward with passing that through to our human resources to get the job approved and establish the position. Um, we also try to post the position well before TPE. Um, we know other institutions are doing the same, et cetera, and so to try to stay on bar and on task with what everyone's doing across the country, um, and also to get the best candidates that we can for our positions. Um, we also uh, outreach to candidates um, and kind of figure out ourselves what we're going to do to brand ourselves, create that intentional personal, personalized experience for folks going through. And also, before we get to the placement exchange, we like to kind of figure out what we're going to bring as in our swag items. We all have giveaways or fun little goodies um, that we want to personalize to create um, that intentional experience, again, for the um, candidates that we will be speaking with. I'm going to let Jen talk briefly about kind of some of those items, um, and then we'll move forward. Yeah, so this was a really important part of our process. Uh, when I went through as a, a candidate the year before, um, this is really what struck with me. And it, it wasn't because, oh, great, I got a free item, like, you know, I'm going to pursue this school. Um, but you could tell sort of their um, their commitment to the experience, their personality. Um, one of the schools that I interviewed with was in California, um, and they gave me – after uh, it wasn't my first or second interview, I can't remember. They gave me a, a CD, like a, you know, a little mixtape of uh, songs from California, um, just to be cute. They gave me uh, after my first interview, they gave me a little fake mustache and said, "We mustache you for a second interview." Um, so that really uh, stuck with me. That like, okay, they've got a sense of humor. That's clearly something that's important for them. And so when we were uh, crafting this, we wanted to make sure that our personality came through. We're pretty goofy people. Um, we like to have fun. We like those personal connections. Um, and so I'll show you um, the notes that we used. So for TPE, they have these notes that are, you know, all looking the same. Uh, and you use that to communicate with candidates through their mailboxes. And so on the back of this piece of paper, it had the standard like TPE information with you know the candidate number, the note, your position number, all that stuff. But on the front side, this is what we had. You know, it was our little people uh, and said greetings from Portland, Oregon. And so we used that to communicate with folks throughout the conference. Um, we also so we had a packet of information for people. So the folks that were scheduled ahead of time for interviews, um, and then folks that we scheduled while we were at TPE, we gave them. Um, folders, information, all that stuff, and gave them a tote bag filled with video. I think something that's really important to know through passing on that tote and the information is we really want to set up our candidates for success. We want them to know and understand the institution and what they're buying into and interviewing for so that we can really see if this person connects, but as well that the candidate connects with us. And so it's really important to be vulnerable and sharing as much as you can to set those folks up for success. Yeah, so those little pieces were really crucial. We made sure to write personalized thank you notes afterward. Um, 
after the interview, uh, for most of the folks, we had a little notepad and said, we uh, thanks for the noteworthy interview. So you can see puns are an important part of our <laughs> working experience. Uh, but again, like finding ways to show that humor, um, that connects. And then we'll talk a little bit too about where those swag items come into play later when they're on campus and all of that stuff. Um, but it wasn't just about throwing information at them, but it was about sending a message with the information that we were putting out there. Um, you know, we had uh, pens, all the swag items, and lots of information, like Courtney said, to just make sure that they were well equipped. Yeah, and so a couple of other tidbits to know before going to the place in exchange is making sure that you have your file folder set up, that there's a clock for the table, that you have clipboards for the interviewers, so that you all can kind of mainstream that process pretty seamlessly. One other additional piece of um, information that we send to candidates is we send an email prior to TPE giving them information. We have a video series on our website if you all pdx.edu slash housing. You'll see some videos just about your story lives here. So we send that information, we send our handbook, and we send a couple of other items so that they really can get ingrained in our system and make sure that works for them as well. And so it's really all about that that success for the candidates as well as us. And you'll keep on hearing us talk about the intentional and personalized experience. That's key and crucial because what we're trying to do with our employees is what we try to do every day with our students that live in our buildings and within our communities. We want to build them to see what we do on a daily basis. And so that's really key during our recruitment process is that we're trying to, you know, um, create that ripple effect from the candidates to Portland State, to our residents who ultimately live with us. We like to be intentional and personalized in everything that we do and our personal connections. Um, and so that's just an added glance there too. Shall we talk about the placement exchange now? When we get there, um, it's extremely important to establish team dynamics with your co-interviewers. So for instance, Jen and I, this is our first time doing this as a team going to TPE for Fort Portland State. Both of us are first time for Portland State and doing this. Um, and so we want to talk about what that looked like and making sure that we were um, purposeful in our intentions and that we worked well together and collaborative. We know who was asking the questions and how we were able to create a pretty seamless process. Um, also, make sure to prep before each interview. Um, look over the files that you may have created for the candidates, look over their information, and if you have any pointed questions that you've kind of written in their files related to their experiences that you want to learn more about or that you're excited to learn more about, be sure to ask those questions at the same time. Also, be on time to pick up candidates. A minute early is even okay. Um, it's setting those time frames up for success and making sure that you have the student's name, or excuse me, student, you have the candidate's name um, written or on a diary's border. For instance, Jen went up with a flag and was like, said the person's name and showed the flag. So it was identifying for the candidates. So the, we ease the candidate's tension and anxieties a little bit and create that more of a welcoming feel for them so they're not looking at us when we're just standing there and not saying much. Um, it's also important to be clear about next steps with candidates about your process so that they know what to expect. I think we want, it, we want transparency. At least um, how our department works is we're very transparent in communication as much as possible as um, and what we can do. And so uh, translating that into our recruitment experience is key too. This also alleviates that stress again and makes the candidate feel welcomed and supported by our department. Um, also, as Jen mentioned earlier, writing those personalized thank yous. So making sure that you're scheduling time to do that. Um, after you maybe have three or five interviews, take 30 minutes to write out your thank you notes so you don't get caught up or get bogged down with as many thank you notes as you may need to write or forgetting to write those thank you notes and being personalized, that it's okay to have breaks too, because um, then that also refresh you. You need lunch as well. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're balancing out yourself during this process just as much as doing as many interviews as you can, because being as refreshed and um, as welcoming as possible is really um, key in this step too. Um, also, it's okay to be open in your communication with candidates. If you like a candidate and you're on the second interview and you want an on-campus interview with them, it's okay to offer them. Um, we offered three on-campus interviews during TPE during second interviews. Um, we knew that there was a fit and a connect there, and so we wanted to bring that to our campus to see if that works with the rest of our team and with our institution in general. So it's okay to already start planning those next steps while at the placement exchange. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, as a candidate, that's really helpful to just not have that uh, that hanging over your head to know that like, yeah, no, I did nail that. It makes you feel pretty good. So uh, we're going to pause for like 30 seconds, give you a chance to ask any questions about um, the employer perspective, and then I'll talk about the employee perspective um, and how that was for me. So we'll give a, a quick little chance to see if you have anything uh, and then be back in with you. So don't mind the few seconds of silence. Great, so we are gonna move right along. So I'm gonna talk, as I said, about my perspective as the candidate going through um, TPE. So just imagine this this person with the gray pants and white shirt talking at you in person. Uh, so I, I knew from the get-go from like a solid year before that TPE was what I was going to be doing. Um, the placement exchange really I think has a lot of opportunities for different schools across the country. I was looking for schools uh, mainly in large cities um, and wanted a, a new experience. So TPE was really a great option for me. Um, so I started researching a long time before. I had a, a massive Excel document that I just collected sort of every piece of information that I could, um, putting in there, you know, the, the department's mission, the name of the director or person handling the hiring process, uh, making notes about their program, notes for the school. Uh, I would look through information that I could find um, online, you know, regarding any statistics or anything like that. Um, finding sort of rankings, not important, but like other information that uh, could come into play. Um, I was on the, the TPE website pretty much from the get go. Uh, I think October 1st was the first day that you could post your resume uh, and I had it up there October 1st. I think I was candidate like number one or two. Uh, Cause I, yeah, I mean, I knew what I wanted, knew what I wanted to do. Um, so really just started reaching out way in advance for the actual placement exchange. So I'll talk about that. Um, I had that Excel document or, or you know, even just created separate documents for each school. Uh, I printed out the job description. I came up with specific questions for each school. And so um, all of the interviews that I had were scheduled before the placement exchange. You don't have to do that, but it's really helpful on a candidate side and the employer side to have all that stuff um, squared away ahead of time. Obviously, it's okay to leave room if there's a stellar candidate or a stellar school that pops up out of, um, you know, towards the end, then you want to leave room for that to happen. Um, so I had those questions prepped ahead of time. I knew sort of my key things that I wanted to ask. For me, uh, prepping for questions was a huge thing. I There's a couple resources online, and if anyone wants some suggestions, feel free to reach out because we can share those, um, that have you know sample questions for folks, uh, especially for student affairs folks. And I so I spent hours. I would go on drives, on road trips, and just have that list of questions. I, don't worry, I wasn't reading while driving that, yeah, but uh, but did have that information um, and would practice my answers and not practice so that I had them memorized, but practice so that I had an idea. When you're asking me, you know, about a crisis situation, when you're asking me about my supervision style, I could think of actual examples rather than just tell you, yeah, here's my supervision style. Um, and so, so I spent hours, you know, working on that. Um, you know, even just talking in front of the mirror and making sure you're feeling comfortable and your, your presence is good. I would say a couple things that uh, you should have prepped um, no matter what is why you're interested. They're probably going to ask you that. They're going to know why you're interested specifically in their school. So have those um, concrete examples because if you're just like, oh, I think you're a great department, that's not going to sell them on you. And then uh, most of them will probably ask you to tell us about yourself. So try and think of an intro. Um, you know, it, you can include some personal details, but I think talking professionally, this is your first intro to the group. So you want to have your uh, quick professional points to share. 
And then um, another one that I got a lot was what's something on your resume that you're most proud of or something along those lines. And so thinking about uh, what you're proud of, what stands out for you. And I think that's good either way um, for the, the intro too, because you can talk about a point of pride. Um, packing list. I mean, you want to have your suits, you want to have all that sort of stuff. And I've, again, I've got like really specific packing list. Uh, you know, even just talking about my little um, Colgate wisps, those are really great. They're lo the little like, you know, brush your teeth thingies in between better than a mint. They're quite refreshing. Uh, so the actual interview, um, what I looked for, I, I knew sort of what my bottom lines were. Uh, I knew that, um, you know, what location I wanted to be in. I knew the sort of position. I knew what I wanted from the department. I knew that I wanted that personal connection from the department. Um, and so having those schools that were giving me the mustaches after the first interview really stood out to me because I knew that there was a personal uh, connection there. Um, I, you know, gained perspective from those initial interactions. And so if, you know, if the interview is really formal and that's how your department is, that's okay. But if your, you know, department does take the time to enjoy each other and laugh on occasion, it's okay to show that through the interview. And I took those, those moments in the interview when I was with a school um, as a sign, you know, that means something when they are able to look at each other and make a joke or have a moment with you and, and make a joke. Those uh, were definitely important. Um, don't overload your schedule too much. I had 12 interviews. I thought that was perfect for me. Um, going through this process a second time, now having done it once and then being in a different position where I've got a little more experience. Um, I did turn down some schools for second interviews. Uh, it just didn't feel right. And it was, it was a nice feeling, not because I'm like, oh, I've rejected you. That feels nice, but more that this isn't a good fit. I can recognize that it's a good fit and I'm not going to move forward with this process. Um, I will say that with the second interview, uh, all of them asked me why you're still interested in the position. Uh, so making sure that you're not just doing a second interview because I'm interested because you offered me a second interview, but you know, I'm interested because this really stood out to me and these are um, the reasons that I want to move forward with your process. So um, we're not going to pause, but feel free to type in any questions if you've got them as we're going along and we'll make sure to address those. Next up, we're going to talk about um, our on-campus interview process, but between our TPE and our on-campus interview process, if you know some of your can candidates are going to NASPA and you also have some professional colleagues going to NASPA as well, it's great to make a connection um, with folks while they're in NASPA too, just to be able to gain more insight from other folks that you work with, but to also gain another lens into the institution in which you work. So now we are going to venture to Portland, Oregon, um, per se, and we want to talk about um, kind of some of the pieces and items that we do um, for the on-campus interview. There's some prep in advance. Um, and so before the candidate comes, we want to make sure that your folks in the department and division that they may be connecting with are aware of um, who is coming and what that looks like and um, set our uh, colleagues up for success in interviewing the candidate. Um, also, just making sure, for instance, we set them up at University Place Hotel, which is part of the institution, and we um, put some swag items in there and also some fresh cut flowers. So it's a little bit more than a hotel room, and it's a little bit more personalized in a folder set up there with their um, on-campus interview. We would also send the on-campus interview schedule to them in advance via email so they get that, but it's nice for them to already have that folder um, and information when they get here too so they can take an at-a-glance again and that we're once again setting them up for success for their interview day. Um, and so that's just a couple pieces that we'll highlight there. Um, and it's also all about being personalized and personable. So we pick up our candidates from the airport. Um, we want to make sure that they um, have as less, this is a common theme that you'll hear me talking a lot about, is less stress and anxiety and more um, excitement and want to learn about our institution. And so by doing that is one way to really let them feel engaged with um, us personally and professionally. Um, 
We also try to give them a tour of Portland. A lot of folks, it's their first time in Portland, and so we have different staff members volunteer to take um, candidates around and give them the real at a glance of uh, Portland from the little parks and forests that we have within the city to some of our voodoo donuts and salt and straw ice cream that we like to highlight um, and that people kind of know about across the nation. Um, and so it's great to get kind of a meal and a tour of the city and the day before the interview. Um, Jen, for instance, spent five hours touring with one candidate, just trying to get an at a glance, but also building a relationship and a rapport with the candidate so that um, we can see the connections and build from there professionally. Um, I'll, as mentioned, a welcome bag with snacks, swag, and a note left in the hotel room. Um, and then also something during the um, interview process and within the schedule is it's great to have meeting after meeting with different partners, Dean of Student Life, the director, et cetera, but also creating a time and a place where it's more low key. For instance, we take our candidates to um, a fr frozen yogurt location and we have our entire department come and the candidate come and we just kind of have a conversation and see how the fit and connection is there. Um, on that personal level to see, is this going to work? How does this work for our, our team? And, and do we feel it's just uh, a natural connection? Um, it's also um, imperative for them to kind of eat with the director and associate director. And so we take them to dinner after the day of the interview and kind of have a low key conversation and more about hobbies, experiences, what questions may you have that you can get to answer and just really trying to create a natural and um, welcoming, calming environment for them to really feel engaged in our process, to ask whatever they might want to ask. Um, because this is a longer term commitment that we're looking for from someone. So we wanna make sure that they're able to really have that time to invest in us as well, but also to interview us. I mean, it's a two-way street, you know, and so it's really important for them, to, the candidate, to feel that way too, that they have that time to interview us as well. Um, and then we will drop off our candidates at the airport as well. And so that's something um, just to add on to that, to that end. And something that Courtney started doing uh, this past year was having them do case studies uh, instead of presentations. Uh, and I know as a candidate, I much uh, I would have much preferred a case study. I did a presentation when I interviewed at Portland State before Courtney took over the process. Um, you know, and there's lots of different folks in the room, and and that's great to have perspective. But are they actually going to be interacting with me on a daily basis? Or are they are they key people that really need to be the ones making the decision? Whereas you know, Courtney had a crisis. Tell me about a crisis situation. And so having the time to really dig a little deeper um, and get that perspective. I think was really helpful um, rather than just, you know, because you can craft a presentation to present whatever you want. Yeah, I think, thank you, Jen, for bringing that up. Um, and I think it's important that you're looking at that job description and seeing some of those essential, pivotal, um, descriptive items that this position is going to do and really honing into that and seeing and making sure that that connects to your departmental institution expectations but also in the formulas which you work within your department that we're all aligning here and that you're bringing in someone that can also um, align to your process and that you already work on or if there's some trainable moments, but overall the vision is the same. It's important to make sure that that vision and mission that you're working on as a department is um, apparent within the candidates that you may bring in. So thank you for bringing that up, Jen. Um, great. So I'm gonna talk again about my perspective as the employee. Uh, so there we go. There I am. Yep. So uh, this was, you know, this is the moment. You've got your on-campus interviews. Um, I had four on-campus interviews. All of them I felt um, pretty excited about. Like I, I didn't have major reservations going into the process and knew that I wanted to pursue my candidacy with this, with these schools. Um, don't waste your time or the school's time if you're really not interested in the school. Obviously, we need jobs. It needs to happen. But uh, if you are, if you're knowing in the back of your head that like, well, if they offered me a job, I probably wouldn't take it. Then don't go through the process. Um, it right from the get go, uh, I wanted to have a clear understanding of what it was that was still interesting. I was finding interest. There we go. Uh, in the job, in the university, in the school. 
um, so that I can articulate that throughout the process and so they can understand and I could ask appropriate questions. Um, so I spent a lot of time sort of reflecting after TPE, after my second interviews with all the schools, um, I wrote down the pros and the cons that I had from all of the interviews. Um, and so spending the time to reflect then and see, okay, what, what are my reservations now? Um, what do I need to learn more about? What am I really excited about? Um, I tried to spend a lot of that in between time between TPE and the on campus, you know, doing more research. Um, you know, as Courtney was talking about, we have a lot of videos at Portland State and a lot of information out there. And so spending time really digging deeper uh, and getting your hands on whatever it is that you can um, that you can find. The uh, the schedule was really helpful for me. And so if you can share your schedule ahead of time, I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, some of the interviews that I went on even had um, sort of the topics that would be brought up during each session. Um, I think our process is um, less like really interview heavy and it's more about that fit and connect and spending that one on one time as a director or associate director. Um, and so some of the schools, it, you know, it was okay, this hour session is going to be spent on supervision and crisis management. This other hour long session is going to be conduct and whatever. Um, and so creating questions specified to that. And so I would have different pages in my notebook um, regarding their conduct, regarding their supervision styles. Uh, if I knew that I was meeting with people from different departments, thinking about what questions I should be asking those specific departments. Any more questions? Obviously, there's a point in the day when you're like, no, I'm good. I've asked 50 questions throughout the day. I don't have any more questions. But if it's early in the morning and you've run out of questions, um, you know, I think that says something to them and then to you as a candidate. Like, are you thinking critically about this process? So some other things that I thought about as I was going through were those team dynamics. So, you know, at something like Proyo, who's interacting with each other? Are uh, are the housing folks interacting with the residence life folks? What is the uh, connection between the supervision levels? Does it seem like it, you know, people are sort of shuddering when the, you know, director walks in and, and their mood changes or whatever it might be. Um, so you want to pay attention to those power dynamics. Uh, those were really important for me to look at and um, again, sent a, a clear message as to how the department works, you know, in their downtime, because this is a, a, a different setting. When you walk into the office, what sort of feeling do you get? Are you able to talk to the student worker that's there or the staff member that's there um, at the at the desk? Those are things that are really important for me because that relational piece is huge. Um, if you can, I would definitely make sure that you're showing working spaces if these are live-on positions, or sorry, living spaces and then working spaces to give an example. Um, you know, we definitely try and show folks at Portland State their potential apartment or what it would look like. Because um, that's a big component. Obviously, if you are moving to a new city or moving on campus, you want to be able to see sort of where you'd be living. So making sure to carve out time. Um, and, a, and a thing with that too, find, if you are showing an apartment, make sure you're showing an apartment that is clean and looks nice and is orderly and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it, it, that says something to folks too. Obviously, it's not um, a huge message, but if you're walking in and showing uh, someone's apartment and it's pretty gross, uh, that might send uh, a message you don't want to send. Uh, looking at the collaboration with other departments too, those are things that I really tried to pay attention to. Um, you know, if other departments are helping out with the interview process, what does that look like too? If you have someone that is hosting you. So, you know, I'm at a school and I've got somebody that is sort of um, taking me under their wing for the day. Uh, what's their connection with each other? Are they introducing themselves to the to the person from another department? Is this the first time they've met? Because that could be an interesting thing to note. Um, don't be afraid to ask clear and direct questions. If you've got things as you're going through the process that uh, you are, uh, concerned about, worried about, like, don't be afraid to just be direct. Um, I, going through this process was definitely um, where I was at, what I was feeling, what reservations I had, um, you know, how I felt. I think it was okay for me to tell um, a school that, like, yeah, I had a really fantastic time, and I, I you know, 
I wanted to be honest that like this is how I'm feeling and and anything that I'm sort of thinking about um, get an understanding of their benefit salary timeline you don't want that to be you know the only questions that you're asking but make sure you have a clear understanding of either where that information can come from or you know when you might be getting that information or whatever it might be um, for me it was okay to share my timeline uh, and other prospects with the schools because I if they wanted me I wanted them to know I had other options not as a like a carrot to hang over their head but just to know that like I'm I'm gonna I'm moving forward and I'm gonna need to know sort of where you're at with stuff to be able to um, to make a decision properly um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit so after TPE I had four on-campus interviews and I went from school to school so if they booked my travel, they knew I was going to another school. Um, but I didn't hear from a couple schools by the deadline that they had said that they were going to contact me. And, you know, I think it's as an employer, it can be a little frustrating when you follow up. But as an employee, like I, you, you said that you were going to follow through by this date. And so I'm checking in to see sort of what's going on. Um, and so I, I wasn't afraid to do that, didn't hesitate to do that. Some of the schools, it was that, you know, they ran into an issue here or there, or they just hadn't stuck to the deadline and, you know, ended up offering the position. So um, I think we operate under such caution when we go through these, these processes. And I think it's important to, but I think it's also important to just be authentic. Um, and I think we mirror that through our process at Portland State. Um, you know, as Courtney said, when we had the second interviews at TPE, we knew that three of the folks we wanted to bring on campus. And it's okay, in my mind, not to like, just, you know, uh, bring people along for no reason. Um, and the same thing goes for me as a candidate going through the process. Like I was, it was okay for me to share where I was at and, you know, what would be impacting my decision um, if I was offered or wasn't offered the position. So uh, we'll give you a second if you've got anything um, that you, uh, you've got questions about, get them some voodoo. Yeah. Um, that, that's Courtney. How, how that's how Courtney decided that she should come to uh, to PSU. Yeah. So a little nugget there is um, I'm from a very small town in North Carolina, and so once I knew I could venture to Voodoo Donuts and back, <laughs> I knew it was meant for me that I could navigate the city and feel comfortable and okay with that. And so um, a <laughs> Blue Star Donut. So yeah. So <laughs> someone just wrote Blue Star Donuts are the bet are the are better. Um, are better. Yeah, that's that's something that we have going on in our department. There's always a little uh, tension when you bring up Voodoo versus Blue Star. <laughs> hey, thanks for that, Michelle. Michelle seconds that. Uh, um, and so, yes, go Blue Star and Voodoo. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're going to move on to what happens when they are on campus. So we are onboarding them and uh, and getting them connected to our university. Great, and so I just want to mention prior to even um, having that official letter is making sure you're going through your HR processes appropriately. Um, sometimes um, the HR processes, well, they all look different at different campuses, and so really being ingrained and making sure um, that you're going through your systems that you do for hiring and creating that official letter, et cetera. Um, and then after that's out, you get the background check-in if you do that, and the official letter or the offer letter is hired and back in your hands. Send out some information to your department and supporting staff who helped with the search and really thanking them. Um, and then welcoming the new team members. And um, something uh, I do is I communicate with our new team members, asking what's the appropriate email I can send before they get a PDX email, because they have to actually wait until their first day on campus to get that. Um, that's beyond our control. And so making sure to offer that out to folks to start that welcoming process for our students. They're now a part of our family, a part of our team. And so how can we create that to be as um, positive and uh, supportive as possible? Um, and then after that, an another key piece is keeping continual communication before the new member arrives. Um, and so through an experience that I had, um, I accepted, I signed the letter, I never saw an email come out of a welcoming, 
um, I never heard from the uh, my supervisor and I was pretty much in Wyoming and still hadn't heard anything and was pretty darn nervous that was I dreaming um, and so thank goodness by Wyoming I heard um, that I was actually uh, getting ready to be welcomed into the team and so just seeing some of those experiences and being able to work through that and really um, defining that process is key. Yeah, and I had a, a similar experience, well, uh, different but similar. I think um, the reason why Courtney and I are so passionate about this is we didn't have the best experience prior to. Um, yeah, our our hiring process uh, was not fantastic before we took over, obviously. Uh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, I had lots of communication with my incoming supervisor. Um, but it wasn't accurate. There were typos everywhere. And I'm not like super worried about typos. That's not, I'm not one of those folks. Uh, I think Joanne who's sitting with us, she's an English major. She catches all those things. I don't catch all those things. Um, so for me, uh, getting information that was inaccurate, um, she had uh, introduced me to my new, um, the RD that I would be supervising virtually. And in the email, he was brand new as well. In the email had, really just inaccurate with inaccurate positions that I had had that I had never been to Oregon, like all of this stuff. And so um, it just set the tone that I was like, not incredibly excited to work with this person because the information, every piece of information that I got uh, just didn't make sense to me or whatever it might be. So making sure that you're taking time, obviously beforehand, um, you might be excited. You might want to get that email out there, but take a second, reread it, make sure that it's clear concise and, and make sense. And as a supervisor um, and starting this communication plan for your folks that you're onboarding into your institutions key, once we hired, I devised time in my schedule every single week to dedicate time so we're actually able to spend time on it and send out those emails um, correctly and appropriately, but also maintaining that communication, which I mentioned earlier. Um, continually keeping that communication flowing and having a topic for each week. For instance, we just hired two new RDs onto our staff and this week's topic was move-in date. And so we tried to hammer some of that stuff out, making sure that we're conforming to the schedule of the new folks coming on and giving them a week or so since being hired on that time to kind of plan and see what their life is looking like and when they're able to transition in and also giving us some time to breathe before connecting, reconnecting. But I have a regular weekly connection that goes out to each new hire until they get to campus. And they can even be fun connections about learning about campus a little bit more. It doesn't always have to be something related to the position um, directly or the transition, but always also welcoming that time for them to ask her questions, or excuse me, to ask questions. Always ending with that, so any that they might be um, pondering about or anxious to answer that they're given that, that option to do so. Um, Another key piece is details for the arrival. Also sharing that in advance and as, and as soon as possible. Like I said, we wait just a week after the official hire to start hammering out some of those dates. But then also once you get the date, what does that look like? Is your candidate coming um, from across the country or flying in? And do they need an airport pickup? Making sure that we're facilitating that experience for them because once again, we want to make sure that we're creating that experience that we want this new employee to give to our residents. Um, we want to make sure that we are we are going that extra mile to have a positive. I uh, started at uh, my previous institution that was Syracuse University. They. Um, are really great. They have a, a huge department and they're really great about welcoming new folks um, and helping them unpack their stuff if they need to. So we would have folks that would show up with giant moving vans and there would be 10 of us there to help bring all of their belongings. It's sort of, you know, you knew that it happened for you and you do it when, when new people come in. You know, it's a, it can be a little overwhelming, but I can say that when I when I started, uh, my parents not carry all those things that was coming from undergrad and my parents not having to haul all those things, you know, in hot Syracuse humid weather um, was really nice. And, and it just created that from the beginning that clearly folks cared about my arrival. You know, there's a welcome sign on my door. Um, 
and, and that was really nice. And, you know, uh, Courtney, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that too, just creating a, a warm uh, environment space if you have Livon folks. Yeah. Um, and so just to tag off what Jen was talking about, um, we actually provide a welcome basket for folks in their part in their apartments um, and fresh cut flowers again. Um, and so some uh, some basic food items, toiletries, other necessities to get them through that weekend so they're not stressing about having to immediately get to the store. Um, but they can spend some more time acclimating to their new space and just feeling that, hey, I can make some pasta and sauce right here because um, it was provided to me and that was really appreciated to just have that time to just take a break. Also making sure that you know their dietary restrictions, um, preferred pronouns, etc. We even do that um, before their on-campus interview so that we're accommodating their need. We do not want to give a vegan gluten-free person pizza um, for their lunch, etc. if they're doing if you're doing connect. And so making sure you get some of that defining information um, as soon as possible to really show that you care and that you want them to um, feel the the positiveness of the experience. Um, also, make sure um, that you're setting up all HR-related items um, that you can before their arrival, too. Um, that's something that we try to do here. Our system's a little different where it has to be day one for a lot of things, but I can at least fill out their key request and wait till they get their um, identification that we need. I can at least do some of these pieces to have forms filled out, et cetera, and all we need is to plug and play some of the information that they'll get their first day. We also here at Portland State have a mentor program that we do for our uh, new hires. It's very informal. It's nothing that's standardized. You don't get a case management folder and have to do certain curriculum items with them. It is pretty much organic that, for instance, I'll set Jen up with um, someone. We try also, we have housing operations and we have residence life within our department. And so we actually try to bridge that gap during this mentor piece to give, say, we have a new housing operations person and we'll give them a residence life person. Um, and then if there's a new res life person in, we'll try to give a housing operations person. Granted, we are heavier on the residence life side of the house, so sometimes that always that doesn't always come to fruition and that's okay. Um, it's really looking at this new employee and seeing what their trainable items might need to be to see what some of those pieces that we learned from them in their on-campus interview that someone's strengths might be within your department, connecting those together so we try to eliminate those barriers that that new employee might have on our, on our campus. And also, we ask them just to go to coffee every now and then to check in to, with their mentor to make sure that they're feeling supported. If they might have any other questions about the area, that this is like a personal slash professional connect um, and so that they can really feel that genuine support given by our department. It's something that we want to do. Um, and we found great reward for that. Um, and I think it's something that we're just trying to, to hone in for the experience of that new, new staff member. Great, so shall we talk about their first week here on campus? Yeah. Okay, um, so first week on campus, day one. What we try to do is actually start with voodoo or maybe with this start date coming up, we might have Blue Star Donuts instead, seeing folks' um, preferences. Um, we'll have the entire department come together and all have some donuts together, or some breakfast items together, and really just engage in how excited we are that our new team members are here. Um, after that, um, I personally walk them to human resources so that we're able to get all the human resources paperwork done. And then we venture together to um, our Office of Information and Technology so then they can get their um, emails and they can get their ID cards. Then after that, we'll see if anybody needs to go to parking and get some of those incidental pieces um, done, but that need to be done before they can do anything else. Um, and so after that, then they'll just go throughout the day and we'll connect on um, other aspects um, on campus about tours and then walking them through our um, our new team member to-do list. Um, 
But Jen has to, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that first day is really important. And again, like, not having, uh, there were reasons why changes were made. I didn't have, like, the best first day experience. Um, I was given my schedule, um, and it was just sort of, you know, go to these things, do these things, hope you can find HR. Uh, and then, you know, I met up with my supervisor later in the day um, and had some regular connects and stuff. But that first day I ate by myself in the park box, which is a beautiful place to eat lunch by yourself. But um, I did not get the warmest of welcomes. And uh, yeah, and it just, it wasn't that, um, that excitement. Uh, you know, really had to go around and facilitate those introductions myself with folks, um, you know, going around to our office uh, or where our housing folks are introducing myself rather than having somebody to help facilitate that process. I'm, I am able to do those things, but it's nice to have somebody to help with that. Great. Thanks for that input, Jen. I think another priority um, before they get to campus, but also that um, really connects to their first day is having their office space ready. Um, I had a different type of situation where I actually had to work out of my apartment for a month on my own personal laptop while my office was actually empty and somebody just hadn't moved out of it yet. That is not a way to set your, your new employee up for success to make sure that we're showing them that we want to treat you with as much um, respect and um, support as possible just to get you started within your position and your role. Um, also, when you're touring folks around campus, make sure you facilitate introductions so they're starting to get names with faces, etc. We do a department, we even do a departmental tour because yes, they were here on campus. Yes, they might remember a few names, but it's important to go to every single person again and every single desk so they can really start grasping who's in the department and who does what because that's extremely important once you really get started in your position to know. Um, also, scheduling informational interviews with campus partners. Um, is key so that they also see who we directly work with and what some of that working dynamic looks like, but also what do we work with on a daily basis. Um, also plan some team lunches and potentially after hours engagement. So the first week they're there, like I said, we do breakfast and then the Res Life team does an all staff lunch together. Um, and then we also hold summer lunches for the most part, um, same time, same place. And so we also try to be make it a priority that we do have lunches um, every single day of the week at different locations at the same location so that the person feels like they have folks to eat with and be engaged with um, on the team. Also at the end of the first week we invite the entire division um, to a happy hour at four o'clock to welcome our new folks in and also give other folks the opportunity to meet them as well outside the department um, and so that's been something exciting that we've done. Um, also, laying out clear to-do lists and providing training materials um, is needed. We don't want our new folks just sitting at their desk, playing around, getting their email started, and now what? It's okay to give them a pretty heavy to-do list and set it out by priority to-do items per day. That's kind of what we do. We set out each day and what some of those items look like, but then there's other to-do list items in just a list. So if they get done their list for the day, they can go over to that next list and start hammering out some of those other to-dos that might not be as much of a priority, but something they still need to do by a certain deadline. I think setting deadlines is also key so that folks get items done and they're not just lingering there once their the real life starts and their position starts and they start really diving into their daily tasks. Um, something else I do is checking in with new folks at the end of every day to make sure to answer any questions they might see and to offer any additional support. Um, and so that's really key. It's also important when you're giving them that to-do list and um, sharing that with them, telling them have a separate pad, whatever that might be, so that you can write down those other questions that come to mind instead of trying to have to be reflective throughout the day. I want you to already write those questions down. Another key item is also everyone orders office supplies. We've set up their desk as best as we can, but we might not know of some of those items that they really like to work with. Let's make sure they get those items. And so giving them the opportunity to look through Office Depot or Max or whoever you might go through to order some additional items, whether it's a planner, a special pad, a special pen, it means the difference to that person. And so really providing that. Um, and so then um, that's the first week, first couple weeks. And then with ongoing onboarding, making sure to scare, uh, schedule, to share the schedule of the onboarding and training, um, to celebrate work anniversaries. For instance, our department just a couple of weeks ago had a cake at one of our at our first departmental meeting, and 
congratulated everybody and said happy work anniversary. And so that was something that we were able to do, but also trying to make it intentional if you can for those specific days for folks. Um, also having check-ins with leadership of the new employees is important and then conducting evaluations on a regular basis so they know where they stand and they know how um, they're working with the department and institution. Great. So uh, we've got just a couple more minutes. We're going to open it up. Uh, our contact information is here, um, but we will see if you all have any lingering questions or anything like that um, that we can help um, answer. And I'm just going to move this. Sorry. Uh, okay. You can still see our email. Good. So um, good. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, um, really helpful to share. If you're going to be walking a lot, yeah, you can make that decision if they should wear uh, what sort of shoes they should be wearing. That's excellent. Um, great. Well, um, our emails are there. Feel free to. I'm going to hide this again. There we go. So, yeah, um, you can see my email is there and then Courtney's email is there. We're happy to share any information that we've got. Um, and uh, happy to keep the conversation going. Yeah, definitely sharing best practices and experiences is how we make our institutions and our profession better. So really don't hesitate to reach out if something triggered you of what do you ask, what interview questions you ask during DPE for the different interview number one, number two, et cetera, or what does your on-campus schedule look like? Or if you want to debrief more about it, don't hesitate to email. We can set up a time to chat um, if you want to kind of look at your what you do and want some support there. So just don't hesitate. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Kate with some important updates. I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to you. Great. Jen and Courtney, thank you so much for your webinar today. It was really wonderful, some great tips to take home, and I think folks have a lot to think about and, and start to generate those things. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone who has called in for our webinar um, on July this Friday, and thanks for um, allowing us to push it out a week because everyone was off. Well, not Canada, but the U.S. folks were off last week, so it's great. Um, looking forward to August, we have a great um, presenter lined up, um, Eric Scott, the Assistant Director for Sophomore Year Experience at Central Washington University, is going to talk about the Sophomore Year Experience and some of the things that they are doing at Central. So please join us for the first Friday webinar for August. And in general, um, I am Kate Flowers, and I'm the Professional Development Committee Chair. Um, committees are just one way to get involved in Northwest so I encourage you to check out our website, um, northwestacuho.org, for other opportunities around the region. So um, thank you so much for joining, and we wish you all a wonderful Friday.